So I think we'll all take out our phones, our smartphones, and take the what? I don't have one either. <laughs> I can't help either. You got two of them, do you? I will start calling people off. Come on down. I like this room, though. I like the ceiling. That's very nice. And the, that's really lovely in here. Did you guys all bring your Diet Pepsis? It was in the program. I found some wine. Wine. You're a man of sensitivity and taste. Okay. Cheers to all of you. Thanks for coming tonight. We have here with us Clay Eels, the editor of the book, right here with the camera, who uh, is also does a lot of camera work. And he was the editor of the, you may remember this, of the what? West Side Story. What? West Side Story. West Side Story, the history of West Seattle, and also of uh, what else? West Seattle Herald. Oh, yeah. When I met him, he was the editor of the West Seattle Herald when they were starting to debate about having the bridge or not having the bridge. Uh, and he decided to have it, and he did a big special on it, and that's where I first met him. And that was about similar to the time that I met Gene, who uh, I've been working with for about 35 years, I think. I think so. Somehow it's put up with me, but not all of us do. It's tough sometimes. Normally it's okay. And this young couple here met in school 30 years ago. Oh, no, like 45. 45 years ago. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> How can you be so fit? <laughs> and um, where do you come from? Thanks for taking a break. Just down off we go on the dock. That's why we buy screw times. I think this is a little off. He he detected some problems there. Play did. Okay, Gene's taking over. This is Gene's show tonight. Sometimes I'll interrupt him, but not often. Okay. Oh, he, he, that's a lot, right? Okay, that was one. Yeah. Here's another one. Oh, two more. Wow, we're really good. We're cooking. Come on in, you guys. Is that who I think it is? I don't know. I, don't know. I haven't. <laughs> He's oh, laughing like he knows that. That's Roger Downey. He is truly one of Seattle's greatest polymaths, encyclopedic understanding of life oh, and where wow. we live. <laughs> no. That's what he is. Wow. He, he and I were involved in a newspaper together in the 70s called The Helix, which was an underground press syndicate. How do you say syndicate? Syndicate without teeth, it's hard to say. Underground Press Syndicate paper from the uh, late 60s. So we're, we were both involved with that. We're, we're going to actually visit that in about one minute. Okay. We're going to look at some of the Helix we're stuff. We're not going to visit Roger. We are. Roger. We can stop and we can have Roger <laughs> tell us his stories as well. Yeah. Good to see you, Roger, really. <laughs> Lovely to see you. We Well, 
you tell us. Well, no, I just, he did a marvelous translation of a, of a piece called Hamlet Machine, which he let me use at a, at a program 25 years ago. So. Well, he was generous, too, though. He was extremely generous. Good deal. I remember loaning him five books, I don't think I ever beat What's that? What's that? Back in the 1960s, presidential elections were called creepy pee pee's. Now, little tiny television cameras, except they were filled out there. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing in life as we now know it? I mean, I don't really, I'm not involved Your with it. What do we, what do you do now? Are you writing for which publication? on your mentality? I'll let you know later. Yeah, that'd be nice. <sighs> I'll take you out for fish and chips sometime. On me. Or maybe Gene. So we are going to have a show now, a shoe, and uh, then we're going to try to sell you books. And because there's such few people here tonight, we expect each of you to buy at least three or four books. And that's all right. Not you. Not you. No, no, I'm going to try to listen. Oh, do you want to come up and stand, sit next to me? Oh, okay. Well, here goes Gene. I give you Gene Sherrard right here in my right. Well, thank you very much. We're going to see if we can lower these lights a little bit. I don't know. Is it possible? Kind of bright for our purposes. Yeah, technology got to the point where they can lower fluorescent lights. <laughs> well, they might be imitation. They might be LEDs, right? They could be secret LEDs. Why don't you turn them off? Or maybe just turn them off and leave the hallways on. Well, let's get started while we start to think about it. They're going to go see if they can have a search. Up or down? Well, it's better to see the slides if they're yeah. if they're down. Yeah. Of course, you can divide the room into two. Even like the front, very front lights would be nice to to dim. Is she in charge? You... Oh, that's perfect. Look at that. Well done. Give them a hand. That's well done. All right. Well, we start every show. This is our what club play our. This, this is our 16th out of 22. And uh, there's the man who actually arranged them all, Clay Eels, the guy right here on my left. Here You're looking is. actually behind Clay. That's Clay right there. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he set it all up. Start with, we'll start with some entertainment. We'll, we'll waste some time while, yeah. while, Paul is, uh, while Paul is here languishing. And we're going to start with a little biography of Paul Durbeck. Let's start with that. Yeah, Shall we begin with that? On it? I don't think we have speakers, so you'll have to listen to it through my laptop, and I'll hold the microphone up to it. But this is... They could vote on it. No, they don't know yet. Mm, okay. And we, we're going to waste a little time. because some people come later? Some people may think that we are starting at seven, so you'll get the little, you'll get the prefatory door pat bio to begin with. So. <laughs> are you ready for it, Roger? Here we go. We call this the War Years, and Paul has a title for it. This is Saving the World for Democracy in the backyard of the parish home of Emmanuel Lutheran Church 
in Spoke, Grand Forest, North Dakota, mm, uh, during the war. During the war. That's right. That would be the World War Two, not the. Uh, not World War One. No. You look exactly the same. He does, doesn't he? That's very sweet of you. Would you like to move closer so you can hear better? <laughs> Okay, we're going to take a look now as we sort of meander through this kind of magnificent life. Here he is. He's got about four stops, I think. The baby of the family. Paul, surrounded by his brothers, Norm, Ted, Harvey. What was the third one's name? Maybe you should let me handle it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, that's Ted uh, holding me. He's the oldest. And, uh, by the way, all of these lovely guys are dead now except for me. And I'm the youngest. That's Ted, who was a psychoanalyst here in Seattle and worked at this, also on the faculty at the University of Washington. And then Norm, above him, was the handsome brother uh, on the upper right hand corner. And then the, the shorter guy was Dave. He turned into to be a big preacher, a kind of a new age preacher for the Lutheran Church. And, uh, and the top two guys then were the were the conservative door pets, and my brother and I were the progressives. <laughs> Although they all had a sense of humor. Actually, everybody in the family did enjoy humor. My well, mom let's look at Can I talk about my okay. mom? Can I go? Can I wait? We're going to get to talk about my mom. Can we show the picture of your mom? So we can do that. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can talk about your mom while they're looking at your brothers. Now, these, these are the brothers 15 years ago. <laughs> And the handsome one, there he is. Yeah, there he is, second from the left. Wow. There's Ted. And there's we could have a Norm. beauty contest right here. You guys well, yeah, feel great. Yeah, I think the handsome might change over the years. <laughs> wow. All right, I know you'd vote for me. That I wouldn't would. be fair. <laughs> okay, now you can talk Sometimes about I feel your like mom. Trump, you know that? <laughs> now you can talk about your mom. There's mom on the right. Mm. And dad and me, okay. What did you want to say about your mom? Oh, I loved her. I loved my dad. We had a good family. Did she spank you when you were a kid? No, I pleaded for it, but she refused. <laughs> really? Yeah. What was her name? Oh, it was Ida Garina. But you called her Cherry? Cherry was her nickname, yeah. Ida Garina Cherry, yeah. Huh. Oh, you were paying attention. I was paying a lot of attention. Yeah. We, we only have a few minutes to waste till seven. Yeah, we got to waste some money now. But I'm going to tell you a little story to waste some time because Paul's dad was a preacher, first in North Dakota and then ended up at, in Spokane. And Paul and I, about 15 years ago, did a Christmas show for Felix Bunnell. And we did a, uh, a recording of The Gift of the Magi. And Paul was the narrator. And one of his father's parishioners heard Paul speaking on the radio, intoning, and she said, oh my God, it sounded exactly like Reverend Dorpat. So there are no recordings of Paul's dad because they all burned up in the church. In a church fire, yeah. So to I'd love to hear us and give a sermon, really. Maybe you should not that I would and be just converted, but so. I'd like to hear the service and yeah. sermon. <laughs> See, I, I theorize you should give it, you could read a John Donne poem and then just listen to yourself and say, that's it. That's my dad. That's my dad. <laughs> well, he was, uh, he got me whatever records I wanted, you know, when I was a kid. And I'd say, I'd like to have that record. And we'd go right down and get it for me. What was the first record he got for you? Uh, the Old Master Painter on the Faraway Hill. Because it was theological. No. Do you remember that song, The Old Master Painter on the Faraway Hill? Roger, do you remember that song? Which one? The old master painter on the faraway hill. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sort of theology. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to sing it? Or? Not one of the, the old the master hill. painter on the faraway hill. Not one of the, the big, you know. It wasn't a big hit, no. <laughs> no, no. no. We, we were sort of, sort of esoteric. Now, I met Roger when he was at Lewis and Clark High School in Spokane, a year ahead of me. And he was uh, on in the band, in the school oh, band. Oh, sweet Jesus. This goes back even farther than I could go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then let's go. Memory. <laughs> you, you, were, you were playing uh, the um, French horn. Right. Yeah. 
Well, let's we go admired him a lot because he's obviously not only that. But let me say one more. Can I say one more thing? About sure. Roger, uh, sure. We got time. Stop for people from bullying. Me. Me. No, go for it. Uh, Roger was on the one of those smart kid panels <laughs> that was national. You know where they put them on it and they answered questions. Maybe the G. What was it? College Bowl. Oh, college. Bowl. And we creamed them the first day, and a week later they creamed us. Mm -hmm. Really? So we had one minute of uh, elimination. Yeah, he was a college boy, a genius. You know, Kevin was a genius. Let's face it, super bright, and he could play the, the, the French horn. <laughs> one and the other. Simultaneously! Yeah, he, he did, he could do it together. Okay, yeah. let's move along with the story later. <laughs> okay. okay. We've got more people here. Is there yeah. anyone else who wants to talk about their first purchase? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got anything else embarrassing to tell about me? <laughs> well, in, in, now you said earlier, Paul, that you and and Roger worked on the Helix in the 70s. 60s. 60s. Okay, but you said 70s, so. Well, I, then you can spank me after this and I'll thank my mother. Okay. okay. Well, the Helix began in, you know, about the same time when I was just pre adolescent and I used covers of it designed by Walt Crowley to offend my mother. And I would hang them on the wall, and many of them were created by Mr. Crowley. Yeah. And this is this is one of them. But of course, Paul was the founder and editor, and, and we look a little further. Not of course, it could have been somebody else. But it was you, right? I was the one. Now, how many of you knew Walt Crowley? Do you know who he is? Raise your hand. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. So, a uh, majority of you, I'd say, which speaks well of his uh, lasting influence. And of course, he and Roger were on different staffs together, not just the Helix, but also uh, at the, what's the name of that paper where you guys were for a long time? What, before? Or after? No, after the Helix. The, week. the Helix is the beginning, I Roger. I never worked anything else with Paul, uh, with uh, Walter. You never were? No. Oh, okay. I went the prose direction, you went the illustration and political direction. Okay, yeah. Very good. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just waiting for you. What do you want me to say? You have to, you have to tell me when you want me to go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So what else What else did Paul do? Well, he's changed, don't they? <laughs> he ran, he started a, a rock festival, which many of you may know, and now he's going to ask you how many attended. Paul? Uh, how many of you attended the Sky River Rock Festival? Well, was that? that was the first one, 1967. 1968. Was it the first one? Yeah. yeah. And Roger was in charge of security. <laughs> you can imagine how well that turned out. <laughs> Were there some gate jumpers? <laughs> it's a long story. It's a good story, and it's going to be written about someday. Yeah. But I'll interview him first. <laughs> well, well, in the meantime, take a look at the lineup yeah. on the first. Hippie Rock Festival in the history of the world. Yeah. Now, Paul claims that most of these guys didn't even show. No, I don't claim that. You, you, you misrepresented me. I said not all of them showed up. Uh, no, no, I mean, considering the weather, it's not surprising that yeah. they didn't show up. The Grateful Dead made it through all the mud. They did, and, and, and as yeah. did Country Joe and the Fish, yeah. and then Richard Pryor. I set up Richard Pryor on his stage. On the stage, Santana, they were there in the middle of the night. Santana, I remember trying to sleep. Oh, Muddy Waters was there. Yeah, yeah. Marvin Gardens. Don't know. Muddy Waters made it. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, Buffy Saint Marie was she there? Buffy Saint Marie. Well, let's ask. Roger was Buffy Saint Marie there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> She wasn't happy about it, but she made it. <laughs> Why wasn't she happy? Because of the weather, maybe? Because of the weather. Okay. Well, she's from, you know, Louisiana, I think, wasn't she? No, considering your typical rock festival, this one was a real turnout 
of a rock festival. Yeah. It was epic. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys were hippies, huh? What's that? You were hippies. Were we hippies? No. We never want to think of ourselves as hippies. <laughs> no, I don't think so. We thought of ourselves as motivating agents. Thank you. Uh, can I use that? I think I will use it with yeah. our camera. Young Bloods were there. Not Who? Young. young Bloods, yes. Young Bloods were there. Young Bloods came yeah. off into the Northwest. We yeah. sort of had a tie to them because uh, the drummer was uh, the brother of a Roger, close friend. If you're going to have a conversation, everyone should hear it. Well, I think the conversation is over. I mean, I, I'm not good with Michael. Uh, he wants it. Just give it not good with media. Give it, please. Yeah, that was satire, is what that was. Anyway, this, this deserves to go down in history as a major artistic event in world history. But it will. There you are. <laughs> Cheers. Anyway, all of you and I should write the history of it. Anyway, go Amen. We'll get together at uh, Ivor's Salmon House. Uh, uh, Gene's got a tab there. You will invite him. And we can have free uh, fish tacos. And uh, <clears throat> and what else can we have, Gene? Uh, Are we just vamping until we're, we're, seven? I'm just letting it run. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> we're not starting the show till seven. So I, I'm wondering whether Mr. Clay Eels is videotaping this. Well, that's good because this is history. We're actually having history occur right now. That's great. Uh, thank you for that. Should we go forward? You want to look at the next slide? You can talk about my dad again if you like. Oh, I love this one. Okay, this is another a slide from the festival. This is early uh, on the first day, and uh, Tom Robbins, who is a local what? How many of you have read a Tom Robbins uh, novel? Raise your hands. God, it's amazing how popular he is. Uh, anyway, all of you have read a Tom Robbins novel, and that's him right there. He's in the black sweater. I'm in the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> He's the one with the hair. You're the one with the receding hair. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's how you recognize Tom and all these. I mean, and um, uh, Paul just looks the hairline. Yeah, the hairline. Yeah. And that was, remember Inger Ann Hay? Oh, oh, that's okay. Sorry, we were talking about an old girlfriend who you, you can see just a little piece of her. That was my girlfriend then, Inger Ann Hay. We lived together and she had two children, a boy and a girl, and we all got together and told stories and ate together. And Who's that hiding behind the plastic? Uh, uh, Let's see, where is it? Where, where is it? Lower left hand corner. Oh. Don't know. It's not so enough face there. The I know who that is. Yeah. I do. That is Hugh Hefner. <laughs> no, he came to the show, and he was he was interested in Inger Ann. I, I, Paul told me this whole story, and I think she ended up in Los Angeles. Okay, I'll buy that. But later, during this festival, it rained a lot. So this is the slide you guys might know. Well. And we always poll our audiences as we waste our time. As we're, we're, we're looking right, for any of us. Are we, we actually wasting time? This is an incident where you've got real history occurring. Right. We're finding out some stuff. We're not just repeating our, our kits all the time. What? That's a good question. Can't down very good. That's why you're the bright one. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> often. Well, you are. And, and uh, many of you are here too, as bright as uh, as Roger, perhaps, and as bright certainly as uh, as I am, uh, because you've decided to come to this event and buy several books, <laughs> and you're thinking about your relatives in Illinois and your and in uh, California. You want to buy them books. So, how many books do we have here today, Gene? Oh, dozens. Well, we're, we made it all possible for you to do it, and then. Clay Eels, who is really the manager editor of this event, he'll he'll have uh, take your money and we'll be on our way. No, we're not through yet. Well, it's all right. He's tall. You recognize some of these people? It's my kids. Huh? Oh, that's all right. Just keep saying over and over and over to yourself. 
50 years plus. That's good. That's how long ago it was. And that was, it did, the sun came out for a little while, but not for long. And this picture was taken, and it's become kind of the, the real symbol of the affair, which, because it, it's, it's uh, brightness and, and daylight are deceptive. It wasn't there during the fair. It mostly rained. But the hearts of the people who were there were sunlit. And if you heard, for instance, uh, uh, the novelist, Tom Robbins' description of it, he was elated the whole time he was there. He was happy as can be. And as was I, we were all happy. Roger, however, well, Roger was happy too, I think. I was too busy with overdoses. Yeah, you were, you were, you were busy. Uh, okay, let's go forward, Gene. It's officially 7 o'clock. Okay, let's begin. And all that, right. to that place that we got through it. How many people yeah. were out there? Oh, we threw the water the party and so forth now. Yeah. Hey, hey, there you go. Right. You got it. So come on in now. You're the last uh, participant tonight, and uh, we welcome you and uh, and thank you too. Could somebody turn? Uh, is uh, uh, there's Romeo, right? Judy Romeo. Okay, come on up here and wave your hand. Now this woman has pretty been pretty much running uh, this organization, the uh, the wooden boats so much draw. for years. Where she is, Judy Romeo. It's okay, Brad. You can stay. <laughs> is that actually the director? Is yeah. Brad Fox is our executive director. Yeah, I don't know him. I know you. So, uh, congratulations. Nice to meet you, Paul. Do you know Gene? Do you know Clay? Oh, yeah, we're going to play your Okay, no. So, excuse the coffee cup. I was sneaking in here. Are you joining us? Say again? Are you joining us? Uh, actually, I'll be joining you in the back of the room. You're busy, okay. Do you want to the mic? Uh, I'm, actually, I can talk loud enough that okay. they'll hear me in the next county. Uh, we want to welcome Paul and Jean here tonight. Uh, it's really special to have Paul back here. He's been a longtime friend of the Center for Wooden Boats, and particularly of Dick Wagner. I can remember sitting up on the uh, old Lakeside Ferry one day in the early 90s, while uh, Paul and Nick Wagner and a couple of other folks uh, did a, an informal panel. Uh, informal means nobody carried knives, but they were doing a panel on maritime heritage, and I have never heard so many wisecracks in my entire life. <laughs> Those two guys together had really wry senses of humor. And uh, as a, uh, a birthday gift to uh, Dick Wagner several years ago, Paul wrote the foreword to Dick's book, Legends of the Lake. Uh, we're out of it right now, but it will be getting back in the store soon. And you can read a, a very beautiful tribute by a very special man uh, to our founding director. Paul, we're so happy to have you guys here tonight, Eugene, you too, and Clay. And with that, I think we could probably get the program going. <laughs> uh, Judy, did you mean the program to start at 7 or 6.30? 7. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, there we are. What did you think it started at? 6.30. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. 6.30. 7. 7. All right, all those, all those who knew it was 7, raise your hand. Well, most of you knew it was 7, don't you? Book signing was at 6.30. Oh, you see, you're confusing that, aren't you? That's it. Okay. So you should have been signing books all Concern about what that we're supposed to start. Yeah. If not, let us proceed. Okay, thank you, Roger. Roger gives us the go. Shall we go? <laughs> Let's yes. go. Okay, so after Paul's dabbling with music and journalism, he moved into history. 294 Glimpses of Historic Seattle came out in, I think, fall of 1981. And he sold it for 294 cents. Came out months before his first column, which was in the Seattle Times in January of 82. And how many copies did you sell? Well, we believe it was uh, 
40,000 because we had three printings of, at four printings of uh, 10,000 each. So it was a huge uh, popular thing because it was only $2.94. And uh, people would look at it and they said, that's cheap, I can afford that. And they bought it. They bought several copies, even as you may be tempted to do today with the bigger book, but much, much, much better book called, and Clay, what's the title of the book we're showing? Seattle Now and Then, The Historic Hundred. And that addition, The Historic Hundred, that's his inspiration. There you go. So you're uh, applauding Clay's uh, additions if you buy three of those things. <laughs> All right, but don't do it. One's enough. Just uh, go ahead. I don't want to be too pushy here. Here we are. Going to do it. Everyone knows this mentor of Paul's. Uh, what a sweetheart. You know who that is? The guy there? Murray Morgan. Murray Morgan. If you What's that? We spent a lot of time together, and I learned a lot from him. I loved his writing, and I was made a better writer because I paid attention to what he did. I still wasn't as good as he was, but, uh, but uh, I at least started to approach the, the banks of his window or something. Murray wrote Skid Road, and it's never been out of print. In fact, a new edition is coming in right now. So part of Paul's work in the, as he began the column, was to spend a lot of time interviewing people. And here he is interviewing Lucy Campbell Coe, who was witness as a child to the Seattle Fire. And we're trying to place the timing on this because there, there are four different uh, persons, all of the women I met and interviewed, that had witnessed the fire as children. So uh, that sort of... Uh, Startling fact, really, when you think about it. Well, you know what startles me about it? What's that? You know what startles me about it? No, I don't. You is that you give us multiple choice? You, you've never, it's all women who remembered the fire. Oh, yeah. Men, didn't, men who witnessed the fire all died off. Yeah. Or they lost their memory. What did you do that? Maybe that's the case. Memory. They were drinking <laughs> on the night of the fire. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, these were all kids, you know. Okay. Go ahead. You may be Here we are. We're going to jump forward to the two of us. We started working together on, on a photo project, uh, Washington Then and Now, in 2004, which came out in 2007. And by 2011, we put on a show at the Old Mohai, and it was just called Now and Then. We were joined by our friend, Berenger Lamont, who did uh, the introduction in the, the foyer of the show was filled with Paris now and then. And, uh, and then we moved into Washington State. Yeah. Because we could get away with it. <laughs> yeah. And Berger, uh, we actually, we're going to jump back a little bit and uh, there's a, a short video of, it's about a minute long, of Paul meeting someone in Paris in 2005. So let's take a look. This is probably the highlight of the show, really, Gene. Take his photo, and she sent him back for a last glimpse. <laughs> what I love about this moment is watch when I stop laughing and the camera stops shaking. Watch their expressions as they both look up at, at the same time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And this is Berenger's photo of the same uh, uh, uh. She went back about five years later and tracked him down, and he's a Romanian Orthodox priest in Paris. And here he is about 2013. How often do you meet your doppelganger? It's, it's never happened to me, but I think this is... You hold on, that could have, you have a chance still. Their taste in spectacles was, is, is very similar. The way they wear them on their very similarly sized noses. Is, and their taste in hats. And their taste in hats. We never spoke to each other. No, I refuse. I, I, I'm a, a Presbyterian. No, I'm a Protestant. No, I'm a Lutheran. I don't know what I am. But I don't talk to Orthodox. No. All right, so let's start at the beginning of the show. And we're going to start with the very first column that Paul wrote on January 17th, 1982. And it's... See, we, we only discovered that guy years later when she went out and saw him again or looked for him. I remember he, she was saying she was going to look for him, keep an eye out for him. And I don't think he was that hard to find because they lived in the same neighborhood, really, basically, right around, you know, the island, right down, down on the river there near Notre Dame, so he was found. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jane. Okay. So, here we go. This is the very first column that Paul uh, was, did that was featured in the Times. It's from March 12, 1919. It is the return of Seattle's own regiment, the 63rd Coast Artillery, after the First World War. Wow. There was a huge welcoming home ceremony. And I realized, and much of what I do have to do in, in my chores, taking column, column photos and photos for this book, is to find something that matches, in, at least if not the spirit uh, or the intent, at least something dynamic. So I went back on January 21st, 2017, to Seattle's largest march at Fourth and Pike, which is where the original photo was taken. And here we are. The Women's March. How many of you went to the Women's March? Raise your hands, please. Look at look at that. Majority of these people went to the Women's yeah. March, or at least half of them. Mm -hmm. Did you have a good time? Yes. Yeah. 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 My knees had already given up, but Jean was there because he took the pictures. And so, uh, here's the original photo that Paul took in the column, which is in the fall of '81, preparing. For the first column for the time. Clay, did you go to the Women's March? Yes, I did. Wow. Okay, so we're all uh, we're all progressives. <laughs> what we did is we decided to rather than arrange the book thematically, we just kept it simple and arbitrary and let the columns themselves create the the order of the book. First column that Paul did is the first column we feature in the book, and we go through to the final column, which appeared last summer in Seattle. But in between, it's all a jumble. It doesn't, there isn't any chronology that follows their appearance in the paper. It's just, as Gene liked them, and Gene actually put the book together. He's really responsible for putting the book together. Let's give him a big applause, because damn, he did a good job. Okay. <laughs> I'll accept your accolades. Yeah, he did. This is Seattle's deepest snow, 1880. And on Sunday, the day before the snow started, the Elisha P. Ferry, the, 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 the Seattle Intelligencer published Elisha P. Governor Ferry's 1879 State of the Territory Report, in which he stated that ice and snow were rarely experienced in Western Washington. And on Monday, the snow began to fall, fall, and it fell for eight days, 64 inches. Now, this is not at the height of the snow, it's after it, when most of it's melted. So you really can't see its depth here, but this is looking east on Cherry Street from First Avenue. And I went back, yes? You're saying that five, more than five feet of snow fell in Seattle? You got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what they claim, you know. Now you could become Contrary. And what's the word for that when someone takes a different position? Contrary. Huh? There's a better word than that, but let's use that. And do some research and you may find that it's a few inches off, perhaps. 
could be. Anything is possible. The what second. Did say, what did you say? It's a beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful picture. Yeah. It is beautiful. It doesn't look like five feet. No, but that's I really no. Look at the sun job. This is after that storm has passed and it's starting to melt, and uh, that's that's what it is. You know, we, we don't get to see the full snow. There are other pictures of that snow which reveal its depth better than this. But this picture is so wonderful with Yesler's Hall. That's the most important public location in town at that time where everything happened there, the lectures, the dances, the parties, and then behind it is the sheriff's home at Second and Cherry, and behind that is the Baptist church, and then behind that is the, the first ridge of First Hill at Sixth Avenue. So there you go, that's where you're at. And uh, Gene took an out shot, which is pretty, pretty daring of him, too. He went out on a snowy, snowy afternoon to repeat the shot. Go ahead, Gene. No, thank you. This was in February 2017. It was the last big snow we had, and here it is. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that there's just a little cap on that. Yeah. It's very deep, very dangerous. I know. <laughs> I'm asking for a lot of applauses for Gene. But let's do it again. Let's give Gene an applause. First, the chair. Thank you, Clay. All right, we're going to show a couple images of the water. Both of them were taken by the great uh, photographer Anders Vilsa, who spent a little less than a decade in Seattle and then emigrated back to Norway at the urgings of his wife. Well, the threats of his wife, because they went back to visit there, and then when he said, Well, it's time to go back to Seattle. She said, nope, we're not going back, we're staying here. So he had to make up his, his mind whether to stay with his wife or to return to Seattle. And his wife won. So we're looking, we're just basically looking at the foot of Pike Street now in the late 1890s. And we return today to about who, the same Who are those location. kids? Who are those kids? Well, Can those we are, go back again? Yeah, let's go back. What's that thing that looks like an illuminated freeway sign? We were trying to hide that, actually. But this uh, one here? No, no, no. Up and left. Up and left. Oh, yeah. Up and left here. Exactly. I don't see what you're talking about. What's the one of those things that say, to Bellevue, oh. 10 minutes? You know, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think that is, Paul? We've never had that question before in our 27 shows, Roger. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. He's Where talking about, I, I'm going to point at it with my, so Paul can see it here. Yeah. It's this thing here. Sorry, I won't point at you. That's a shadow, isn't it? No, there's a bright light there. It's up here. It looks like an illuminated sign, but it couldn't be. That's a no, 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 no. That's a building that's up on 2nd Avenue at, uh, at uh, University Street. I don't know what it is, but I can find out for you and get back to it. The light is just here. Light shining in the windows. What's that? The light is just taking shadows. Yes, gotcha. Well, I've never noticed that. And uh, honestly, I did not retouch it yet. What? You're not a type head. Anybody who's a type head, they see, oh, graphic image type back there. Good point. It's the only thing that's all my attention to the light. I think you've got that is a mystery. Well, we'll, we'll try to figure it out. Sam says, it says, repentance Somebody else have an idea? Somebody else? You were mentioning something, weren't you? You got suddenly shot at it. All right, who said that? I just said it's the sun shining on the window. Oh, it wasn't you at all, was it? Yeah. Congratulations. They call it reverse sunset in real estate. Reverse sunset realty? Well, no, in real estate, when you when you don't have a view of the sunset, yeah. they call it the reverse sunset, when you can see the sun shining on windows. Oh, I see. It's yeah. amazing. There's two places you can buy ice from within two houses of each other. Yeah. It may be the same place. because that big deal. That diamond ice was big. Deal and it was spread out, so they used two different signs to advertise 
their service of ice. And I'm a nice big deal. Where did they come from? Huh? Where were they making it? Or? South America. South Africa, where most of the diamonds go from. The ice? No, I'm kidding. Uh, what was your question? This is a, this is a, we're going to call There's this show the Malaprop. Two places right center stage selling ice, and it just occurred to me, I don't know where they made ice in those days. Oh, well, I don't know either, and I studied it once and had an answer for it, but I've now forgotten it, and I'm not going to go back and study that one, because I'll be busy trying to figure out what the light is on the left. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to read you from Paul's original column, which will answer your question, and we can solve this right now. Once upon Paul, once upon a time, Paul did know the answer here, so he wrote these words: "Ice or cold storage was manufactured here from soon after the Great Fire of '89 into the 1980s. At the turn of the century, Diamond tutored its product as the best ice, no core in it." That doesn't really answer it. Diamond was. That well, old. if you say if you state the ice was manufactured yeah. there, it does answer the question: Where was the ice manufactured? Oh, it does. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank we you. don't know the process, so, yeah. but we could find that out, really. And uh, was somebody willing to take that uh, that research task on hand and get back to Judy about it? Maybe? <laughs> okay, I guess a lot of you are not particularly curious about it then, are you? You don't even get one volunteer on researching it, not even one. Jean, I think let's go ahead and leave them with this picture. What is it? <coughs> what is it? Speak up, Roger. I have enough research projects. Of your own, I'm sure you do. Okay. Thank you. Let me know. Well, you're off. Go ahead, Slate. You want to tell Gene to go ahead? All right. So here we are today. This is a story of lost to come. The kids. Who are the kids? Well, they're from the school I teach at, Hillside School. This is the viaduct which we're about to lose. And as you guys all know, it's coming down in chunks starting January 11th. It will be gone now, they say, by, the, by early June. It was wow. going to be all the way through summer. They, they pushed it forward to appease the outcries of waterfront merchants who were not happy with losing next summer. Yeah, including the acres of plants. Now we always make this point when we come to this slide, we take a poll to find out how many people in the audience are in favor. We'll do it, could do it the opposite too. We could see against, but we'll say be in favor. How many of you are in favor of getting rid of the viaduct? Raise your hand. Oh! Okay, put your hands down. All those against it, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, Clay has got quite a few, but Clay is a great proponent of the viaduct. He thinks it belongs to West Seattle and that we should keep our hands off of it. Because now, actually, with the new uh, tunnel, we've got to sp spend a lot of money to get from one end of the town to the other, right, Clay? Absolutely, it's yeah, totally. It's, uh, dead. Stick a fork in it. Done. Yeah. <laughs> build, a, build a viaduct for West Seattle. What's that? Build a viaduct on the waterfront in West Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. <laughs> Hear that one? No, we didn't hear it. <laughs> okay. Oh, I tell you that. Graveyard of bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to call attention to this. We're we're. We've done three images, and it's taken us 20 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to ask for a vote now. If you want to go on with the rest of the show, raise your hand, whoever wants to go on. If you want to spend two hours, raise your hand. If you're here for two, there's a two-hour guy in the back. Well, I would say the answer to those questions are that you leave any damn time you want. We'll take the time it takes to do whatever it is we're taking. And Gene, if you have to leave before we're done, well, then we're stumped. But Gene's the only important person here, really, so we have to placate him. Gene, would you please... Well, I think we just took a vote, Paul. Paul and Matt call each other Tick and Talk, the Clockett brothers, because we're dealing with time here. But we have a differing notion of how to deal with an event. Paul likes to go on for several hours. I try to get these things in about an hour or 45 minutes. So. 
if you, it's fine to go on and on and on. I'm happy to do so, but I'm going to let you guys decide, not Paul, not me. And I think they just voted Paul. I don't know how they voted, but I'm all for them. So let's okay. go and do whatever it is they want to do. Well, they want to know. Don't show. know what it is. Go ahead, and we'll do it. All right. Shall we get started? Yes. When you get tired of a subject, if you hear if you hear either of us talking too long, just feel free to say next. Okay? Shout it out. Shout it loud. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. Well, here's Andrew Andersville's the second shot in the waterfront, ten minutes after we saw the first one. And the second one actually has a wonderful sign up here which says Aluminum houses weight 150 pounds, and this is taken in 98 or 99 at the height wow. of the gold rush. Wow. So you've got about 100 boats leaving in a six month period for the Yukon, and all of these guys are seeing these for sale signs, and many of them are buying aluminum houses to carry on their backs up those gold wow. rush mountains. Wow. So we don't know how many actually, we've got no statistics on that. We just know that. But the story is better if you assume it was many. Yeah. No, okay. Well, it had a big sign up there, so I'm assuming it was a lot of them. Look at these guys waiting to get their aluminum house. They're all waiting in the front there. And today, here we are, Marion Street overpass, Coleman Dock. And it's already changed in the last three months. There is no parking down front. That Ethiopian cabbie no longer has a place to park and pick people up in front. He has to go across the street. Anders Vilsa returned to Norway, as his wife demanded, and became Norwegian's national treasure of a photographer. And he spent the next 30 years taking such magnificent photos that they actually did a whole series of stamps recently in Norway. And this is one of them that I tracked down that I just think is, is glorious. He did a lot of portraits of, of people in villages and, and scenery as well, but I love this one. So thank you, Vilsa. He, he was Norwegian. He's just some guy. He's one of the Norwegians who came to town to the New World and then went back and, and became their a national treasure. Six foot three, receding, receding hairline, a uh, little problem in his left heel. <laughs> Is that true? No, I made it up. Okay. <laughs> so here we're looking at a very early view from Smith Tower. And it was before it had opened to the public and an enterprising young photographer went up to the observation deck and shot across. And it was a fairly new view for, because you're looking, you could see Queen Anne, you could see Lake Union, you could see Wallingford. And I want to keep your attention focused on the Rainier Club down below. And behind it, the Methodist Church. So let's see if we can, I'm going to show you. The vacant area was a hotel that was torn down and was about to be replaced with what, Paul? Well, it was going to be replaced with a lot of parking at the start. It's called the Rainier Hotel. It was built right after the fire of 89 and very quickly to take care of all the people moving into town to rebuild the town. And it was not a favorite uh, hotel because it was so far up the hill you had to really struggle to get to it. And so it didn't have the great uh, patronage that they'd hoped for. So it was used by uh, nurses for a while from the hospitals that were being built up on the hill, but then it was just torn down. So let's keep your eyes on this picture today. Again, watch the Rainier Club and let's look how the town has grown. And this is from the same spot at Smith Tower about a year ago. There we go. No more Lake Union. No. Are you going to ask him about the skyscraper? <laughs> Gee? Ask him. No, that's later in the show. Okay. So here we have the, the Scottish vessel built in 1882, a foremaster, the Monongahela, escaping from Lake Union just before the completion of the George Washington Memorial Bridge in 1931. This, was, this picture was taken. And today we return to the same location. This uh, is a good example of a point I want to make about Gene's 
contemporary Seattle that's in the book. Uh, he chose to go out over and over and over again until he got pictures that were truly what we may call picturesque uh, examples of the city. And this, of course, is filled with picturesque qualities. So when you buy this book, several copies, for your relatives in Peoria and others, you are really showing them off the city in its best flavors, and thanks to Gene Sherrard. Okay, let's give him another hand. You know, uh, we took a little time to we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna continue. I, I thank you for all. Can you go back one? Yeah. We have this picture in my condo building. Yeah. Right. I want to wonder, is that a typical tall ship, or is that? I mean, that is a typical tall ship. So that's about yeah. how tall they were. That's be. about how tall they were. And this is a foremaster, it was a freighter, and uh, it had plied the, the, the seas for 30 years and finally ended up, uh, 40 years, finally ended up being towed into Lake Union and it was towed away, sold to a Vancouver logging company and used as a barge. So disappeared in about four years after this photo was taken. Thanks. So today, Bridge completed. We're now going to go up to near the upper deck after we take a look at, we're going to tie the gold rush with, in with the uh, escape of the Monongahela and the completion of the bridge because this was a, a, a golden telegraph key mounted on Alaskan marble, pure gold. It was gold that was discovered by the very first gold miner in the Yukon and his name was George Carmack. And he made this key, and there are 22 nuggets of gold that he found in his, in his own stake. He made the, the key, he had the key made out of solid gold and gave it to President Taft, who used it to open the AYP. Wow. So, AYP yeah. is the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, 1909, our first Washington campus. Our first Seattle World's Fair. We go now to the top of the Aurora Bridge on February 22nd, 1932, which is the 200th anniversary of George Washington's birth. And this is right after uh, the then governor, Roland Hartley, had been, uh, who was deeply opposed to the, to the state highway system and to Highway 99 and the building of this bridge. He was from Everett. Uh, and he... Uh, uh, he, of course, like any good politician, he stood on a podium at one end of the bridge and took full credit for its construction. <laughs> and bloviated on for a considerable amount of time, and at 2.57 in the afternoon, Herbert Hoover had his hand on the Taft key, ready to press it on cue, interrupting Roland Hartley, and the water cannons went off, and the flags unfurled, and the crowds raced, cheering out onto the bridge, and Hartley never finished his speech. And so, let's take a look at the bridge today. And then, I think we have a slide of that moment where Hoover wow. is pressing the button. We know it's a little malicious, it? looks a little malicious, doesn't it? There is a, yeah, he, I don't think he knew what he was doing, but he, he certainly, he certainly interrupted him. And of course, another president used that key for Seattle one more time. And that's John F. Kennedy, who opened the Seattle World's Fair in 62. And uh, it, it's now in the Smithsonian. It's, uh, it's housed there. It was given to the museum after Kennedy used it. And here we are, one of the columns in the book features young Donna, uh, I'm sorry, young Paula Dahl. And she's standing, she was the nine millionth visitor to the fair. And here are her proud parents, and here's the big beautiful dog she won, and here's her very bitter sister <laughs> standing behind her. And here she is today with her class and the same nine millionth sign, uh, she teaches elementary school in Issaquah. Uh, this is the fire uh, of 1889, uh, June 6th. Uh, none of you will remember it, but uh, 
This is looking south from Spring Street in down front, or what's now called First Avenue. And the biggest building on the left is the old Fry Opera House. You can sort of get the sense of its scale by the guy that's standing on the roof to the left side of the highest part of the building. And uh, this, uh, they didn't know yet that the town was going to be really destroyed by 30 city blocks, but they probably suspected it. Paul posits that the, there aren't that many photographers of the actual fire because the photographers were scrambling to grab their equipment and, and race away. So this is, this is one of a handful that was taken. And I went back and could not find a similar elevation available because he was taking it from a building that no longer exists. So I used my 21-foot pole and went back to First and Spring and took this elevated shot. Because we don't allow drones in the city, it's impossible for me to get uh, accurate photos all the time. So I get as high as I can using that, using that pole, but that's about. Here's a couple days after the fire in 1889. It's the Occidental Hotel ruins, which uh, are on a triangular shaped block, which will be famous to you still, Gene. Let's go forward and look at where we are today. We'll pull back a little ways, but you can still see what is the same, that same location, the front of the Occidental Hotel, which of course is now the sinking ship garage. It became, however, after the fire, uh, another hotel was rebuilt on its footprint, the Seattle Hotel. And the Seattle Hotel sadly also disappeared, not due to flames, but a development fever. And here we, of course we had to have parking in Pioneer Square, so we took down this beautiful building, and here it is in 1908, and replaced it with the Sinking Ship Garage. How many of you know the name Sinking Ship Garage? So it's a pretty good, pretty good group. Okay. It was such a scandal at the time Preservationists tried to stop it, and they were unsuccessful. And so a movement began to preserve, uh, particularly when the Pike Place Market was threatened, the Seattle Hotel became a rallying cry. And Victor Steinbrook, who's, uh, after whom a park is named at the north end of the market, led the charge. And there we actually have photos of Victor marching in front of City Hall to, sit, to save the market. And Paul is now going to describe one sensitive feature of... Good. Thank you, Gene. Thank you. Here we go. And you can see it yourself. There we are looking uh, south on first from in front of the Pioneer Building, over the intersection first with James, and then beyond it, Yesler Way. And, and rising like a, kind of the hull to a ship is the west end of the sinking ship garage. And notice at the top of the sinking ship garage, the, uh, the uh, playful... Uh, bend uh, to the uh, rods up there that save the parkers from falling off the third floor. Oh. You see how they curve? That's called basket handle oh. in fenestration, or the language of windows. And you can see the same thing across the street on the Merchant's Cafe building. So the builders of the signature garage, and they never used that name for it, explained that uh, they were doing things that were complementary to the Romanesque qualities of the post-fire neighborhood. And there you have it. When was the hotel torn down? It was 61. I have a lot of really wonderful slides of the destruction done by Lawton Gowie, a guy whose slides I inherited and have been used so often. I knew him also, he was a good friend. Lawton Gowie. He was an organist. Uh, for the Episcopalian Church, uh, Presbyterian Church on Queen Anne Hill and uh, led the choir and was, was killed by a heart attack when he was on his way to church. I didn't have an opportunity then to talk to him about that. Anyway. 
Well, he had the, the, the photographs of the destruction and Victor Steinbrück certainly inspired a, a, uh, a movement to save the market. And here it is in 1907, and we will jump forward to our preserved market today. Can you, can you stay on this? Yeah. I'm going to seize the mic for just a moment to some of you have already thought of this, but I just want to embed it in all of your minds. And it's a real tribute to not only Gene's work in taking the now photos, but Paul's vision for decades. We've all read the column in the paper, but if you think about the magazine in the paper, the reproduction of the photos is not as great as you can get with a coffee table book. Also, the size is not the same. And if you also think about Paul doing these now and thens going back decades, many of his nows are now thens. <laughs> and so the concept of this book is to take photos in the now to update them up to the present moment. And so not only do you get the great reproduction, but you also get a real span of time that is relevant to today. And that was the the concept. And this concept is something that we have not found executed anywhere else in this country. The fact that we have this historical column that's run week after week after week for 37 years is a real tribute to this man over here. And he is a treasure. And, and it's recognized all over the place. And I just want to show you one example that we got a copy of this past week. You'll see this, the now photo up there of the market. Well, this month, 3.8 million passengers on Alaska Airlines will read a full page story about this book that features the now and then about the Pike Place market. Wait a second. Who's responsible for that? <laughs> well, <laughs> it takes a village, Paul, but the fact is it's the concept of the original. Who wrote this article, though? What's who can we thank for about that? Who wrote the article? I wrote the article. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, I just want you to know how much we're trying to and how unique this We want thing full is. disclosure here. And by the way, when you buy this book, if you buy five of them, we give you one of the magic new pillows. You know, for an extra five ninety-five. What is that? Yeah, yeah, you land. Looking at the book, you can have this pillow that will uh, support it. Uh, we don't expect you to do that. Sure, next, 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 five next. copies. It might change your life. People say it does. It changes their life. Thank you. So this Thank is you. a little bit further west, but it's to get the whole stretch of the market. So sometimes I erred on the side of of color and spectacle. Yeah. Oh boy, you are generally very, very wonderfully, Gene. Well, where are we today? Some of you may, if you're following Paul's column, we're, we'll ask this question. This is, just shout out where you think this is. East side, west side of Yellow Hill. Lake Union? Not quite along Lake Union. This appeared in the column maybe two years ago? Yeah. You're close, yeah. you're close, Roger. Right it's, it's between, it's on the west side of Capitol Hill, kind of where I find it. It, there you kind of, kind of. There it is. <laughs> no, you got it. No, Rose, you got it. <coughs> All right, you got the pillow too. That was taken by the photographer in the fifties, Bernard Lingenhauer, who was a Boeing engineer and knew that the the freeway was coming in, and so he, he ran around and documented the change that was about to come. We're looking now at Third and Union. This is the post office. And if you were a satellite in 1908, 1909, 1910, you might say, meet me at the steps. And this is where you would meet until 1958, when it was decided that the sandstone, which had been carved uh, in chutnut and brought down and installed, the steps and the columns were too filthy because of the pigeon poop. So they tore the building down to considerable resistance. There was a faction of people who were not happy at losing the steps. 
and they replaced it with this, with our lovely glass curtain building, which cannot be stained by pigeons. There it is today. This has been called Lawrence Cheek, who wrote for the Seattle PI in 2007, called this. He, I think he wrote this is. It's like a 200 foot long filing cabinet. <laughs> I don't What's that, Roger? Huh? Well, I'm just it? wondering. It's so ugly. It must have been named they after some named it after some representative in Congress. <laughs> we'll look into that. <laughs> so he finished up by saying, buildings like this are worse than nondescript. They suck life out of the street, sapping the public spirit. I think we can all vote on a few buildings like that, but this is a bad one. about 250 of 500 structures in Hooverville down in the, in the docks, Port of Seattle. And looks I went like back. Ballard, Sorry? Looks like Ballard looks down. Yeah. It's similar to Ballard? Oh. Down under the bridge, under the viaduct. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, are those squatters, or are you talking about the block houses they're building? Tents. No, I'm talking about the, those homeless people. Oh, the homeless people, okay, yeah. Well, they don't have Smith Tower to look at that, so let's, hmm. let's look here and we'll still see Smith Tower right in the skyline. Port of Seattle got me a lift to hoist and I was able to get up about 35 feet to replace the perch of the original photographer who stood on the B.F. Goodrich building, which no longer exists. Hmm. This is a tap on for you, Gene. This is, this is Fremont. This is the corner of Fremont Avenue and 34th Street. And uh, trolley motorman James Turner reported a number of neighborhood streetcars. This was taken uh, April 2nd, 1940. And gasoline powered buses were already in operation on roads closer to the city. And by the end of the month, trackless trolleys would join in the revolution. And this was one of the last trolleys to ply the North End. It lasted about another year after he took this photo. Uh, and uh, and soon to be replaced by gasoline and, and, and tires. Yeah, it's 34th and Fremont, and it's an intersection that that has you know there, it, occasionally it has other events transpire. So we had to have some photo of this intersection that reflected uh, you know the the uh, and somehow uh, you know we could we center could, of the universe center of the universe. So we go back now. And what did we find to replace the trolley but two women walking abreast? <laughs> the Fremont Fair in 2017. Well, it's not a substitute, but it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. The headlights of the trolley are. <laughs> oh, 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 I apologize. Oh, Gene, oh, Gene, Gene. We'll have to talk about this on the ride home. <laughs> this is the Goheng uh, Festival in Chinatown in 1921, and what's happened in the International District now is uh, very little. The architecture is just about the same. Milwaukee Hotel is in the same location, and to repeat this group of lion dancers and celebrants, I went into the Seattle Kung Fu Club, and uh, about two doors down, and they all piled out into the street with their masks and their, and their drums, and Sifu John Leung, who's 80 years old, spent, uh, and has been there since 1960, and was one of Bruce Lee's teachers, brought his students out onto the street. And there's the Milwaukee Hotel behind them. And there's John. Uh, how about you guys? Can you identify where we are here? What's that? The Arboretum? Uh, speak up. Arboretum? Arboretum, you, sir, are wrong. <laughs> Portage Bay. Else? We've got Portage Bay, we've had That's Lake Union, we've heard the Arboretum. Portage Bay. Fremont Cut. Fremont Cut. No, you're wrong, too. You're wrong, and you're wrong. Black River. Black Raise your hand. Let's, who, who said Black River? There we go. Well, somebody and said it. They did. And of course, Black River. Where are they? Where's the one? They just raised their hand. Raise again. So Paul can, you know, shake it at Paul so he can you can see it. You have a pillow too, sir. So here we are 
at the Black River before Lake Washington was lowered. And this is probably 1906, I think, when they motored down. Uh, yes, I, I think it's either six or eight, I can't remember now. Hmm. Are those all people of color in those pictures? No, they're not, actually. It's because uh, the, uh, I think because uh, we're, we're dealing with that glare off, off of the river, and it's cutting the light down, and so it makes splash darker. Yeah. This was a, a, a little expedition to try to travel from Lake Washington to the Sound. It was the only saltwater river that actually flowed out of Lake Washington to saltwater. And uh, when Lake Washington was lowered, the Black River, too, disappeared. And here it is today. Yeah. We're looking down South Rainier in Renton, and uh, the Black River does burble up in culverts, and occasionally it, uh, in, uh, in a park in Tukwila, you can see a little swamp, which was a little, a little moisture from the Black River. But for the most part, it's gone. And of course, this is Lake Union. The, these are faces of the southwest corner, southwest corner of Lake Union. So you see that trestle there uh, uh, in the upper left hand corner? That's, Jen, Jean goes back, go back, Jen. I'm trying. You'll, you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> That's West Lake, okay? So all of this has been filled in, this, this southwest corner of the lake. All of it's filled in. That's Western Mill there. How many people here rode the Calacula? <laughs> okay, Roger, hold on. Wait till we get there. Wait till we we're gonna get there. Don't be so impatient. Just shout next. You want to get rid of these kids? Let's go next. Just call next. Okay, next. All right. So this is that same spot, which has been paved over and filled with real estate. And these are two of my neighbor kids taken in 2011 for our Mohai show. Here they are today. Tia and Liana Owen. Same spot. Kids grow up. Now the Palagala, 1948, passing from Lake Union back to the Sound, and you can see the upper decks are filled with passengers. Roger gets to ask his question now. And what's Roger. your question now, Roger? How many people rode on the Palagala that are here? I don't know. What was your question? No, you asked. You asked. It. You asked a question. Did anyone write on the Kalakwa? Did, you, did any of you write on the Kalakwa? Well, Clay did. Raise your hands if you wrote on the Kalakwa. Raise your hand. Okay, one, two, three. Very few. Four, very few. That's interesting. Okay, so Clay, now you're going to come up. And I'm not going to ask for the whole story. I just want to hear the sound effect here. Clay is going to actually demonstrate the sound of the Kalakwa, which actually was, uh, was kind of quite intrusive. Go, Clay. If you rode it, you could actually hear the walls vibrating. It would go. Thank you, Clay. Give it, give it. <laughs> well, I had to go back and get a, a significant photo that, in some ways, matched the Kalaka line. I went back and found this big boat going through the locks. Same spot. And I only found out after I took this photo, it was a ship in uh, Lake Union for restoration, one of the museum ships at Bremerton. This is the USS Turner Joy. And it was significant because the Turner Joy was one of the two boats in the Gulf of Tonga when they were mythically attacked by uh, torpedoes. Here's the Turner Joy in the Gulf of, uh, of uh, Vietnam. And uh, so another uh, interesting, that, and that was uh, unplanned. I just found the biggest boat, and it turns out it was pretty significant. And for those of you who are who don't remember, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution got us into the Vietnam War, and it was the it was the Turner Joy and the USS Maddox that were. It was the lie. It yes, was the lie that got us in. And here's a shot of what remains of the wheelhouse of the Kalakala, down by Salty's in West Seattle, 
And Clay Eels took this shot a couple weeks ago, and here it's still there. This is this is very recent, and you can look through the skyline. All right, so another disappearing landmark that we've already voted on, but this is just uh, days before it opened to cars. And the city skyline has changed considerably since then. But we found some correlations, the red and the, and the Smith Tower. <laughs> and up on the, in this skyline, there's kind of a lovely structure, which both Paul and I and Clay actually really enjoy. It's, it, was, it was called the Mark when it was being built, and now it's the F5 building. And this is spring of 2017, so you can see that the mark is, is just nearing completion. But the, the, the fellow who, um, uh, Kevin Daniels, who was the developer who uh, commissioned this to be built, went to his architects and said, I want a building that captures the spirit of, and all of the qualities of this actress. And while they were building it, this photo stood in its lobby to inspire the workers. But look at the tilt of her, of her cigarette. And then look at the mark. And you can see that. Look at the tilt of her hips. That's the same. And there's, I think that the lower part is her hips, but that top triangle, that's, I think that's, that's got her savoir faire and her grace. And well, I guess we can disagree on that then, can we? No savoir faire, no grace. No, I, is it the hips or the cigarette? I think it's all of them. <laughs> I'm both is okay. Yeah. Can't, we can compromise. It can be both. Yeah. Or we can actually have. Uh, no, that's fine. Right. No. Greenlight, taken by Ashley Curtis, 1903. Now that's a neighborhood that's changed quite a bit. This is Gene's neighborhood. He lives right off to the right of this. So let's take a look, and I fear that you just keep your eyes on the on the Olympics, because nothing much more peeps through. Uh, what is that? Right below the crow, there's the, the crow there. The mountains. What's the overpass? At, uh, it's the overpass. It's yeah. seventy. Can you go back? You bet. There's a third part of this pan, which continues to the left into Wallingford, which makes it so wide that it's hard to really use it, because you have to make the whole thing so small you can't really study it. So we've sacrificed Wallingford, which is at some, some disgrace because some of us live in Wallingford, and they get in trouble for that kind of neglect. Well, in the modern photo, we also lose Wallingford to trees. You can't really see anything, because I do have photos that extend, but the, the panorama is just a big green belt, so you don't see any structures virtually. Is the bird Photoshop? No, the bird actually, this is, about, this is about six visits, an hour per visit, with my 21-foot pole. And so to, to try to get this, I have at least two, 300 really boring shots. I mean, just the one car, one jogger. And so I felt blessed when I had this collision of events going on. And then the crow flew through, and I was praying that it, that it, would, be, it would show up in the picture, and it did. Another good reason to buy two or three <laughs> copies of this book. To reward. Okay, so we're just a couple slides from the end here. This is the oldest house still standing in Seattle. And it, uh, the picture of it was taken a couple decades after it was built, but it was the people in this photo are, are the relatives of someone who, who actually loaned the photo to Paul. Here's Go Ahead, Paul. Well, yes, this is the uh, family that uh, Ivor Hagman grew up into, and his mother is in the white dress on the steps. And his grandma is next to him, or her rather, and then grandpa is on a couple of figures away to the right. It's the dude on the right. 
I think the dude on the right is the rent collector. <laughs> that's just his brother-in-law. So there's an insouciance to his brother-in-law. Kind of a snottiness. And has she gotten into a fight with him over, over his objections to the extra money that she made from the family for taking care of the family and the parents? And so he was the youngest child. So she was responsible for watching out after the parents, and the parents gave her a greater reward in the will. Yeah, yeah. And of course, he just ran a whorehouse downtown. I no, was there. No, like what a scandal! Building that start and then puts a on the. What's that? Edge of the roof like that. And Gene, didn't they? Didn't they grow the tree in the shape of the guy who's leaning next to it? Yes. Yeah, that was intentional. Well, I missed everything you said, though. You well, it's like a, you know, a lace trim on a piece of, on a piece of. What do you think about? That 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 the could course. be like the edge of the roof. Oh yeah. yeah. It's okay, next slide. Next, okay. Next slide. One more bit of information. This was built by Doc Maynard. It was Doc Maynard's house, the second house in West Seattle yeah. after. The first one burned down. He moved with Catherine to West Seattle to, es to escape the enmity of, of, of his fellow settlers. So this was Doc Maynard's house. It, he sold it in, or it was sold in 68 to the Hanson family. And they, this is what, 90s? Sometime in the 90s when this yep. vote was taken? Right. Mid-90s. When was this built? Oh, this was built in the 1860s. early 60s. 18, 18, 1860s. 1860s, yeah. And it's still standing a block down the street from the, the, the waterfront. It's on 64th. Didn't you just tell us that just somebody uh, shared the opinion that the right side of the building here, which is now gone, was not there originally? Didn't yeah, this was, this, was, this was an Ivar's family member a couple shows ago who said that, that this is actually an addition, which means that today's house, which chopped that little section off, is fairly accurate uh, when compared to the very first dedication yeah, of the house. If, if they know what they're talking about. Yeah. There's Clay Eels standing with the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. You can go and see this house. You will find at one end of the street a plaque, but nothing that tells you exactly where the house is. So you have to walk a block down and keep your eyes open, and you can carry the book with you, and you'll see the oldest structure still standing in Seattle. Uh, the house was moved. Uh, I forget the date now. I have it. It'll be in the book I'm writing this next year called The Illustrated Iver. <laughs> Illustrated Iver. Remember that title? Buy several copies. After you've bought several copies of Gene, what's the title of this? I've forgotten the title. It's late. Uh, uh, Clay? Seattle now and then, the historic hundred, Paul. Long suffering guys, these are very long suffering guys. And they bring out the, the uh, populace to us. That's good. Okay. Well, here we are to the end of the show. And this is Princess Angeline. Sitting on the porch of her shack down below Western. And Western is a, uh, and we didn't know where she was, where this shack actually was until Ron Edge, one of our collaborators, and Paul last year, uh, analyzed a series of photographs and found what is uh, pretty close to the same spot. So we're going to go now and see Ron Edge sitting in this spot between the Pike Place Market Garage and the Fix Medora building. And, uh, and uh, Clay has a special way you can see this, Clay. Well, go down to the market and eat at Lowell's. Go up to the second floor and look straight down, and you'll see this narrow green area. It's very easy to see it it's from that viewpoint, but you can't really see it otherwise. It's just uh, toward the water from the Pike Place. This market. is looking up the hill at Western, so we're actually looking east now. Lowell's. So Lowell's in the market. And so this is really the only green belt in that whole stretch, and where her shack was is pretty much the only spot that's open air except for the Pike Place Hill Climb, which is a block down, but everything else is 
completely covered with basements and buildings. Uh, I have a, an alarming note to make here. Judy is standing. Is there something alarming happening? Oh, no, no. Oh, okay. I'm just stretching. Oh, good. good okay. Jean? Oh, uh, here we are. Uh, again, with Princess Angeline in the eight, early 1890s, 1890, 91. And she would often pose for photographs uh, and charge a, a few pennies to do so. And here she is uh, with First Avenue behind her, and she's sitting on Pike, with, and now it's, a, it's Post Alley, before the market, obviously. So we're going to go, and there's Chief Seattle, uh, which we've inset for a very particular reason, because in the book, and in this collection of this photo and its, its, uh, its now version, we have guests who arrived and sat in the same spot, and they are yeah. Mary Lou Slaughter, who is a direct descendant, a great, 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 great granddaughter of Kiki Soblu, <coughs> Princess Angeline, and Ken Workman, who's a great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle through his second wife, and they're wearing these lovely cedar shawls that Mary Lou created. She's a master craftsman. And, and uh, one more fact about uh, Mary Lou is she is the third 80-year-old in this show. There's Paul. There's here's one version of 80 years old. There's another version. Are they an item? What? Are they an item? They are not. Ken is 67. They are. Uh, and they're distant cousins, so they are they 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 keep their distance. We didn't introduce them. So here we go. This is the end here. Next, last slide. Clay stood behind me, taking my picture as I took this photo. And while they are uh, while they're standing, having their photos taken, uh, Ken looked around a couple times suspiciously. And later in Ivar's down below, we had a little snack together. And I said, Ken, what were you looking at? What was going on? And he said, well, someone, I thought someone was trying to pick my pocket. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He says, well, someone tapped me on the elbow. Just like that, and he tapped my elbow. And I, I call this the, it's a nudge of history, because we didn't see anybody behind Ken. And I, I, uh, I find a similar effect when I'm taking a photo and, and everything kind of drops into place and I'm standing there 100 years or 150 years later and I'm looking at that same spot and it might be the eyes of Ellis or Ashley Curtis or Oaks or one of our great photographers of the past. But primarily, uh, again, this is a celebration of 40 plus years of Mr. Dorcat's mission and work. And as Clay said, you just won't find this anywhere else. Um, as part of that celebration, we brought out this book for his 80th birthday. And additionally, all of the columns that we featured in the book are now online at the website pauldorpat.com. So you can go back and see the original columns in PDF form. And within the next few months, we hope to get all 1,800 columns up, and they exist nowhere else on the planet. So if you want to see this body of work, 1,800 of them plus, you've got to come to the blog and explore. So that's, um, but that's it. That's our show. Thank you so Thank much. You. listed at the end of the article. See, hardly any of you do that. And that is so, so, so much better than the, than the article on its own. <laughs> it's just loaded with additional information. The as many as 40 other stories are told on that blog. And as many as 50, 60, 100 other photographs are shown. So go look at the blog, please, OK? PaulDorpat.com. It's easy to remember. What's, what's more, uh, with each of those photos, we, if you click on them, you can blow them up to fairly significant detail. So if you're, if you're ever looking at a photo in the paper and think, boy, I wonder what that looks like full size, you go to the blog, it's there, click twice, you will see it as large as it, 
as, uh, as, it, as it gets reasonably online. So it's a, it's a good resource to go and look at. Fill your screen with, with, these, with these photos, which Matt, otherwise you're looking at. From Gene. Yeah. So. Gene, one last comment. Same website. You can go. If you liked this event tonight, we do have six more events, including tomorrow night at Mohai. All the events are listed on the website. Send your friends there so that they can go to Renton, Tukwila, Mohai, Magnolia. I mean, we've got six more, so this is a special thing. And by wolves. <laughs> so basically, they would be able to see the presentation that you did tonight, right? Yeah, a variant of it. We usually add a little bit and, and chop it up. He's doing so much video. <laughs> Uh, he's doing so much video, there'll probably be something like this on the blog, too. Are you going to join things together, or what? There, these will go up there eventually, but I, and they're all up on YouTube now, but we don't want to put them on the blog until the events are over. Sure. Otherwise, they'll just watch the right. blog right. instead of coming to the event. PR man, right. Okay, <laughs> now, are you going to take the best of from the different ones? And That's going to be a lot of editing, That's Paul. Yeah. That's right. That's right. We're now at about... That's good. I 50 hours. We have a question here, Paul. Well, I really enjoyed this, and uh, I get so depressed around the Amazon headquarters in South Bank Union. What's your reaction to that vulnerability going on? I didn't see any pictures from that area. Okay, you have to speak louder because I'm an old man. I'm going to, can I say it? Because sure, sure, it's something that we've talked about. Yeah. Uh, and Paul, he's asking, why are there so few pictures of the area around Amazon? that whole neighborhood. We were looking for a spot, for example, where the where they built the big globes so we could at least feature now and then there. Is that what you mean? The That's what he said. Well, I've actually written a lot of things about that neighborhood. You'll have to just wait, I guess, until uh, all of it's on the blog and you'll be able to go look at it. Some of it will be in repeats that are more recent by Gene. Some of it will be the old ones that I did, which are just black and white. We've done a couple around Westlake, but you kind of have to go back in the blog yeah. and go far. Well, then there's that, like, that palatial car, car dealership. Yeah. We, Paul Allen bought. Yeah, and we, that, we featured that about three years yeah. ago. So yeah. that's it now. So there'll be some there that Gene will have photographed with the modern equipment and color. And color. Thank you both. I know that we have some folks who are eager to get their book signed, so we're going to take just a couple minutes to shift the signing table up here, and we'll be able to have Paul and Jean sign your books, and we're going to ask questions at that
seen a lot evacuated during the Columbus Day storm of 1962. I was seven. And we had to go down the stairs. We had to go down the stairs. It's very exciting. Really? You yeah. couldn't use the elevator. You had to go down no. the stairs from the restaurant? From the top. Space yeah. Needle. During the Columbus Day storm of 1962. Yeah. I was seven years old. Yeah. Oh, that's a story all the time. So it was, yeah. did you just have a long line of people slowly trooping yeah, down the stairs? Yeah, slowly going down the stairs. Have you ever climbed the Eiffel Tower? Yes. So that's just a yeah, secret. Yeah. No one does that in Seattle. Yeah. Exactly. How do you spell evacuee? E oh yeah, evacuee. E C. Come on, guys. How do you spell evacuee? V A C U E E. Okay. Yeah. A space needle evacuee in 1962. Oh, yes, that's true. Take that's that so home great. And cry yeah, about yeah. It. Okay. And then now oh, how? Look, I love it. That was so great. Thank you. <laughs> and then now, how about what's happening next year? The 100th anniversary of the Waking and Dry Dock Company. I can't say anything about that. I'm not yeah. convinced that convinced it's going to happen. That's a thriller. The 100 is... Why don't you think I it's going to happen? Order. It is. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Who is this to? This is to Gordon. Hi, Gordon. Hey. Oh, I'm very excited. I'm very excited to, to get this. check with you. I'm sorry I didn't make it to oh. your birthday party. I was under the weather. I used to go... Um, <laughs> but yeah. a couple days later, I brought back a National Geographic with your birthday and hunt on it. Oh, 